Good morning, everyone. My name is Danielle Smaha, and I am Manomet's Director of Marketing Communications. I'm pleased to welcome you into Manomet's Banding Lab, where our staff has been collecting data on migrating birds for more than 50 years. Over those 50 years, we have hosted thousands of people, from school groups to researchers to families and other visitors at our Banding Lab. This fall, due to COVID-19, we have enacted strict procedures limiting visitors to keep our banders and staff safe. But we miss seeing everyone and we're excited to be able to connect with you virtually today. Our fall 2020 banding season is coming to a close in a few weeks. And we are excited to share with you about how we band birds and hopefully show you a few birds up close here soon. If you're new to Manomet, Manomet empowers stakeholders through science. With a deep history in land bird and shorebird research and recovery, Manomet supports wildlife and people by engaging communities and partners to reduce pressure on habitats and mitigate climate change impacts. We address these challenges by understanding the science of our natural world and working with partners, including communities, producers, companies, and governments to develop effective management practices. Just a couple of quick things before we begin. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a box marked Q&A. If you don't see it, use your mouse pointer to hover over the bottom and it should appear. If at any point during the presentation you have a question, feel free to click on that Q&A box to enter it. We are monitoring the Q&A and will answer as many questions as possible. If you're unable to stay for the entirety of today's presentation, it is being recorded. We will send you a follow-up email with a link to record the recording in the next day or so. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Now I'd like to turn it over to Evan Dalton, our lead instructor for land bird conservation and our banding team. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, welcome everyone and thanks for joining us on this uh, lovely morning. Um, I'm broadcasting from home, so it feels very weird. Um, but we do have our um, banding crew out this morning, um, out at Manomet, and they are actually, um, believe it or not, closing the nets right now as we speak to uh, uh, due to the weather. Uh, that being said, I believe they actually have some birds, so we're going to uh, kick it over to them in a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, I, hopefully today we have a chance to uh, fill you in a little bit on what we do and uh, perhaps more importantly, uh, some of the things that we've learned over the years. Um, I've got this weird thing um, here. I'm going to stop sharing for a second and then try it again. Um, okay. Hopefully that works. All right, um, excellent. So uh, as you can see here, we've got our one of our most famous birds that we catch in the lab at Manomet. I understand um, people are tuning in from all over the place. Some of you might be tuning in from just down the street from us uh, and some of you from uh, maybe different continents. Uh, so welcome all. Um, but uh, this bird here is a very common one, a common breeding bird in the Northeast. This is a gray catbird, and you can even see there's a hand at the bottom. Uh, and so if there's one thing that we'll learn today, it's that the old adage, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, is fantastic. I think initially that was because that phrase came from people eating birds, but uh, we don't do that at Manomet. Instead, we learn about their ecology. Still very useful to have them in the hand, though. Uh, so as I said, we're located in the Northeast. Um, I realize I don't even have a larger map here to, uh, to show uh, where we are in the context of the continent. But uh, if you're familiar with Massachusetts and this arm out here on Cape Cod, um, we've got our uh, field site located right here uh, on a little promontory called Stage Point. Uh, that's part of Manomet Point, um, which sticks out into Cape Cod Bay. Um, and uh, basically, particularly in the fall, as birds are migrating down the coast, uh, they gravitate towards green areas during the day. Um, most of the birds that we catch are actually migrating at night, which is quite amazing. Uh, that leaves them open during the day to scarf down on uh, lots of berries and insects to fuel their flight southward, southwards. Um, but uh, on our property here, we've got about 18 acres where our nets are located. Uh, and in this picture down here on the left, uh, each one of these white sections represents one of our nets. Um, we've had our nets located in basically the same locations uh, and operated within the same dates uh, for, for over 50 years now. 
Um, and we'll learn because we've done that and we've done it in a consistent manner, uh, we actually can make some really amazing inferences um, year to year um, from, uh, from, what, uh, from uh, what we've collected as far as data goes. Uh, we have 50 nets going um, and these are called mist nets. Uh, they're a passive technique for catching birds. Uh, we don't bait them or anything. And they're basically, they look like a 20 foot long, seven foot tall hair net uh, stretched between two posts. Um, this very fine black nylon netting uh, is very hard for birds to see as they're moving through the woods. Uh, and as they move through the woods, they, uh, if they encounter the net, they'll fall into a little pocket in the net. Um, and then our banders go around uh, every 30 or 40 minutes and get the birds out. Um, this process is usually pretty quick um, and we have a chance to see some of it happening here. This is a video of a gray catbird. This is what it looks like when they're in the net. Um, and a biologist will come along in a second and extract this bird out of the net. Now, depending on the bird and how they're tangled, uh, you know, some of them can be more difficult than others. Great catbirds like to grab with their feet. So you see I'm actually getting some of the netting off of the feet there. Um, and then once you get the netting uh, off of the feet, it's usually pretty quick just to get the netting off the rest of the bird. And now the bird is out and we're good. So once we get the birds out of the net, uh, we place them in a cloth bag for transportation and handling and all of that. Um, it's basically like a pillowcase. Uh, and that's sort of a nice, dark, comfortable, warm space where they can, they can still breathe through it because it's a, it's a pillowcase. Um, but that allows us to transport um, multiple birds back to the lab uh, with minimum impact on the birds themselves. Um, I say the lab because this is our banding lab. Um, you can see just like our net locations, um, it hasn't really changed that much throughout the years. Um, the only major change uh, from the upper right to the lower left uh, is the addition of a computer, which is running a computer program to document our bird data uh, that we've had since I believe 1987. So um, definitely uh, not something that's prone to change. Um, but uh, bird banding is a, a lovely technique and it's uh, and mist netting and, and whatnot. Um, and really it's through the consistency of our techniques uh, that we're able to make inferences year after year. Um, so definitely uh, something that's uh, super fun uh, and uh, very uh, useful. Um, now normally we'd show you guys bird banding up close, but we can't necessarily do that. Um, but when we get the birds in the bags, uh, we then open the bag and uh, take an individual bird out and assess what it is. Um, and when we say bird banding, um, anywhere outside of the Western Hemisphere, banding is referred to as ringing. Um, but it's the same technique where we basically take a small metal band uh, that has an individual number on it, uh, usually a nine digit number. Uh, and we actually affix it to the uh, leg of the bird using a special pair of pliers. Um, the bands come to us in strings of about 100. You can see here a, a bander's got some size zero bands, which are some of the smaller bands we have. Uh, and she's reading off the number into our computer so that uh, we, we make sure we get the right number with the right bird. Uh, each of these bands has a specific a number specific only to that band. Um, that's so that uh, we don't end up putting the same number on multiple birds because that would be pretty confusing. Uh, the bands are made out of aluminum, which is a, a lightweight alloy um, that, um, that uh, actually doesn't weigh birds down or anything. Super important. Birds have to be able to fly um, and we don't want to be negatively impacting birds at all. Um, in fact, uh, the whole process of, of banding a bird and, and measuring it and aging it and everything um, usually only takes a minute or two um, and then we let the bird go on their way. Um, and it really only works if we're not negatively impacting them because what's the point if we're doing that, right? Um, so once we put the band on the bird, we let them go. Now, normally we're going to go visit the lab, but I haven't heard back from them. I think they're still out closing their nets. So 
we'll touch back, we'll, we'll touch base with them um, in a second um, after we talk about what we learn from the birds. Um, so this is what a bird looks like uh, when it has a band on it. Um, they're relatively inconspicuous, um, and a lot of times on some of the smaller birds, you're not even going to notice it unless you've got a pair of binoculars or something. Um, but this is a house finch that lives in, uh, I believe this house finch male is part of a pair that tries nesting under the eaves of our tea house at Manomet um, uh, every year. Uh, so good to have a band on that guy. Um, but you can see that uh, it just sort of rests on the leg of the bird. Um, it doesn't negatively impact them. And actually we've, we've had birds that have had bands on them for, for um, over a decade um, without it obviously impacting their survivor survival. So um, that's a good sign. Um, so once we put a band on a bird, we, uh, then we also take some other measurements, um, which hopefully we can show you in a little bit. Um, but, uh, but yeah, once we put the band on the bird and let them go, uh, we like to see where they go. And that's kind of the initial, was the initial push of why we were banding birds in the first place. Um, we started banding birds at Manomet uh, unofficially in the fall of 1966, I believe. Um, and then we uh, became incorporated in 1969 and uh, the rest is history quite literally. Um, but uh, we started as part of a government operation called Operation Recovery. Um, and that was basically just to put bands on birds uh, to see where the heck they're going. Um, and it was sort of this initial push across the country to ban hundreds of thousands of songbirds um, over the course of a few decades uh, that really sort of gave us the idea of um, the migratory paths that birds use throughout the continent. Um, these have now been referred to as uh, flyways. And they're basically just uh, migratory routes or general migratory routes that birds take. Um, if we look at our bird recovery data, so this is all, uh, this is just a screenshot, um, but um, this is available on our banding webpage. Um, and you can actually go on there and see, um, click on each one of these individual spots and see where the heck they are and, and um, what they are and when they were banded and when they were recovered. But each of the red dots on this map is a bird that was banded at Manomet um, and ended up in the red dot place, which is pretty cool. Uh, all of the green dots are birds that we captured at Manomet uh, that we did not recognize, that were banded, but we didn't recognize the band. Um, and come to find out, those bands were put on the birds in the green dot place. And then those birds ended up at Manomet. Um, so you can see the vast majority of our birds stick to what we call the Eastern Flyway or the Atlantic Flyway. Um, but uh, we do have some interesting stragglers, and there's an interesting story, I guess, within some of these recoveries. Um, one bird that clearly seems not to have uh, stuck to the uh, flyaway concept uh, is this one way out in British Columbia. Um, and this winter is actually a very interesting winter um, in that we have large numbers of uh, finches uh, that are typically seed-eating birds uh, that come down from uh, from uh, the high boreal forest. Um, and these flocks of finches actually only come down in years when uh, food resources are either stressed up there or they're booming somewhere else. Um, and we call those uh, eruption years, uh, where you have this sort of um, uh, massive uh, influx of individuals of, of certain species. Um, the, the banner species of uh, eruption years are things like uh, red-breasted nuthatches, uh, purple finches, um, evening grosbeaks, pine grosbeaks occasionally, uh, and then another species that looks a lot like a goldfinch called a pine siskin. Um, and this bird that went way out to British Columbia was a pine siskin that we actually captured at Manomet um, in the 70s. And then a year or two later, it was recaptured way out in British Columbia. Um, so it gives us an idea that in these eruption years, we're actually getting birds that could be from all over the place, um, but they really are making these large regional uh, shifts in their range and shifts in their movements um, in relation to food resources. Um, but uh, it, yeah, if you're along the Eastern uh, seaboard, uh, even in good years, they can make it all the way down to Florida even. 
Um, uh, keep your eyes peeled if you've got a, a feeder set up, particularly one with um, uh, thistle or niger seeds, because um, uh, uh, these guys will move in. Um, and they basically just look like a streaky goldfinch. Um, and they're often with goldfinches too. So uh, keep your eyes out. That's definitely an, an interesting, uh, interesting critter. Um, so not only do we see where birds go, like I said, since we've had, um, since we've had uh, our nets uh, open and operating within the same dates at the same time, um, and we've actually kept track of when our nets are open and, and uh, how long we've had them open, um, we can actually control year after year and, and account for our effort, um, effort being just how, how many hours our nets are open. Um, and we can actually use those uh, to infer how bird populations, or at least the birds that we're catching, um, are doing. Um, and so uh, through that, uh, we can actually uh, corroborate uh, one of the larger sort of press issues that came out a little while back, uh, saying that we've lost a massive portion of our birds. Um, and we can actually pick up on this in a minute um, but uh, it looks like the banders are actually uh, coming online here. And I believe they're probably wet uh, from closing all of the nets uh, amidst the rain. Um, but I do believe they have some birds. Are you guys actually uh, ready to show some birds or uh, should we wait a minute? I'm, I'm ready. Okay. All right. Hi. Good morning. Oh. Hi there. Hi, sorry. Good morning. Ah, perfect. Excellent. Can you see us? Yes, and we can hear you as well. Okay. We're going to pin you, pin you guys to the... Here, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. All right, so this is in the banding lab here. So this is... Everyone say hi to Megan. <laughs> hi, everyone. So... Um, we just actually ran around and closed all the nets this morning uh, for rain, unfortunately. We thought we were gonna have a little bit longer, um, but we got a few birds. So this is, a, this is a common fall migrant here. It's a recapture, so you can see it's, it's already banded. Just trying to figure out the video here. So this is a, um, a black hole warbler, and they're really neat birds. They're gonna build up a lot of fat to go on migration. Um, so I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to put the band in the computer real quick because it's a recapture um, and we don't ban birds again. So it's already banded. I'm going to tell Sarah at the computer that I have a recapture. I'll read out the band number. Recapture? Yep. So the band number is 2870 Yep, and it's a black hole. So now that bird's in the computer, I can go ahead and take a couple of different measurements. One of them is the wing cord. So it's a, uh, it's a measurement of basically how big the bird is. So this one's got a 66 wing. And sometimes uh, certain species, you can sex them by wing cords. So black is one of those species. So it's got a 66 wing and I can check one of our little charts up here. Uh, so below 68 millimeters is a female. If it was 72 or above, it was a male. I had a 66 wing, so that makes this bird a female. Lots of fat. I'm not sure if this is going to be able to work, but... <laughs> <laughs> might, might be hard to see. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, but it's just like this yellowish bulge that they, they uh, build up in their hollow. Um, and these guys are going to pull up fat on for migration because they're going to fly basically non-stop over the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so it's got four fat, no CP or DP, those are our breeding characteristics. Now I'm just going to blow all over and check for, uh, for molts. So birds have transparent skin, that's how Megan is actually able to, to uh, by, by blowing apart the feathers she can um, see through the skin essentially and uh, the muscle underneath there is sort of a dark red color and any fat that's built up as fuel uh, is sort of an orangey color. 
Um, so also, another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. So <laughs> I'm also going to use the transparent skin to um, look and see its skull. So when we skull a bird, we're looking for uh, the ossification of the skull. So when birds are young, they don't have that second layer of ossification. So Oh, as they grow older, their skulls ossify, and you can see that line of ossification moving. So um, if it's a young bird, then I'm going to be able to see the line of ossification. If it's an older bird, then I should see that the skull is all ossified. I'm just going to check under the lights. As I was saying earlier, there's a lot you can learn from a bird in the hand. So this bird is fully ossified, but by looking at some of the plumage characteristics, I can tell that it's a hatchier bird. Um, so overall, the PP coats here are super brown, kind of uh, pointed, and the tail is also very, very pointed and hatchier. It's hard to see, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we know it's a female by wing cord. And one of the last things I'm going to grab is the weight. Fifteen point six grams. Nice, healthy black pole weight. Excellent. Awesome. All well, right. I'm going to so you guys have a few more birds, right? Yeah, um, Cynthia has a. Did you look at We had a cardinal, but it was let go. We, <laughs> okay. But we have some more birds. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I guess maybe we'll uh, we'll check in with you guys in a little bit. Sure. Um, if we can, I guess we'll mute you and turn off your video. Does, or can you do that? Um, Sarah, and then. Sarah's moving. So. Oh. Okay. Uh, I guess we did that as as admins. Look at that. Um, so yeah, we'll check, we'll check back in with them. Thank you guys for uh, showing us how the process goes. They're going to enter that into that uh, ancient computer system. Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, we'll check back in with them in a little bit. Um, let's see. Okay. So I'm going to try to bring this back. Okay. Awesome. All right. So um, yeah, like I was saying, since we've uh, kept track of when our nets are open and how many birds we're catching, obviously, and all of that, um, we can actually make inferences year after year as far as um, just overall numbers of birds that we're catching. Um, some of you may be familiar with the publication that came out late last year um, that was talking, uh, that was uh, sort of compiling a whole bunch of data from different uh, operations and survey uh, locations that basically said that uh, over most of North America, we've lost about a third of the number of birds that we used to have back in the 70s. Um, so over the course of only a handful of decades, um, we've seen pretty uh, catastrophic uh, drops in the numbers of birds we're catching. Um, and it might not be super obvious, and, and I know we're, we're all probably pretty uh, tired of seeing graphs at this point. Um, uh, particularly graphs showing bad news, perhaps. Um, but uh, this graph is just sort of reiterating that idea that we, we at Manomet are also catching fewer birds than we did when we first started. Um, we have seen sort of a bit of a leveling off in the last decade or so. Um, and that's an interesting, uh, interesting thing that we're, we're, uh, we're sort of following up on. Um, but uh, I should note that this is uh, overall just general birds that we're catching. Um, this doesn't take into account individual species. Um, the main drivers of these declines are species that we call neotropical migrants. So birds like that black pole warbler we just saw uh, being banded. Um, so neotropical migrants are birds that typically um, either breed in uh, northern US or further north in the boreal forests of Canada. Um, and then those birds actually migrate south um, in the fall and spend their uh, off season uh, down in tropical areas like Central and South America or the Caribbean. So we call them neotropical migrants. Um, and the vast majority of neotropical migrants are what's driving uh, these declines. 
there are some species, particularly resident species in Massachusetts, um, that are actually going the opposite direction. Um, one of those is a bird that we caught this morning, apparently, uh, the northern cardinal. Um, and this year has actually been, uh, we can ask the banders in a little bit, but they've actually had quite a few cardinals this season. Um, and uh, this is a species that's really sort of taken off uh, in uh, Massachusetts since we, even since we began banding birds uh, back in the uh, late 60s. Um, and this is probably attributed to a bunch of different factors. Um, one of them is that uh, in general, our winters have been milder, um, but that's not entirely the truth because we have, we certainly have cold snaps still um, and deep freezes still. Uh, but the one thing that's different now is that a lot more people are out there feeding birds and a lot of folks have planted um, uh, some uh, great overwintering habitat for these guys as well as breeding habitat for them. So there are a lot more territories for cardinals now. Um, they can survive the, the harshest of winters because of bird feeders, but in general, um, the winters are milder and they don't have to rely on those feeders for, for survival. So um, they've got a lot of things moving in their favor as far as the Northeast goes. Um, and we've actually been able to track that through our banding data. Um, numbers aside, we can also look at timing too, um, which is something we've begun looking into uh, more and more recently, uh, particularly in relation to uh, how uh, perhaps earlier uh, springs or more, uh, I guess there's more variation in when spring begins and ends at this point. Um, and so looking at how birds respond to that um, has been pretty enlightening. Um, Birds are great indicators of environmental health and environmental change because they have wings and they can move wherever they want. Um, if you're studying a forest, it can't really get up and move. Uh, and so uh, the changes that occur amongst plants, for instance, um, might not necessarily happen as rapidly as some of the changes you see in bird populations. Um, so because of that, they really are sort of environmental uh, canaries in a coal mine as far as changing changes go. Um, but uh, in this case, uh, we can see that uh, spring arrival dates for certain species are changing. Um, one such early spring migrant that's, um, I guess this is another thing that banding shows is, is um, uh, movements of birds that you might not necessarily notice if you're just out bird watching. We don't particularly recognize individual blue jays. Um, so when we see blue jays in the woods in the early spring, we just assume that they're the same ones we saw there the day before or the week before. Um, but in reality, blue jays are actually migrating up and down the coast. They have a very short, uh, short migration, um, but they typically move around quite a bit. Um, a lot of that's related to uh, um, acorns as well, acorn crops. But, um, but yeah, we can actually see that if we look at the, the average arrival date um, of blue jays over the last few decades, um, just over the course of um, 40 or 50 years, um, they're actually arriving on average um, a week and a half earlier, which, you know, over the course of a year, that's pretty significant. Um, so uh, definitely some interesting things to be looking at there. Um, as far as, um, as, far as uh, how that impacts birds, we're still not exactly sure. Um, for something like a blue jay, uh, their migration is quite short. Um, so if they, you know, if, if they're uh, trying to move north and things haven't thawed out quite, in, quite enough, uh, they actually are able to uh, sort of um, uh, push, push back their migration a little bit and, and wait. Uh, whereas something like a black pole warbler that's got to fly across the Gulf of Mexico on its way north, um, that bird is not very aware of what's going on up north um, over the over the course of the winter. It doesn't know if it's a temperate winter or, or whatnot. Um, black pole warblers uh, overwinter basically on the equator, uh, so they don't really know what's going on in North America. Um, so if it's a particularly late spring or an early spring, um, you know, they could definitely uh, mistime their arrival uh, if they come back on uh, around the same time. Um, and so we can have kind of a mismatch in available food um, and temperatures uh, to, to that migration. So that could definitely have a detrimental impact on, on the birds themselves.
Um, so yeah, uh, keeping track of timing. So we've gone from uh, researching where birds go, and then through the years we've noticed that uh, bird populations are declining, and we've also now noticed that birds are actually changing their timing and their phenology, so their, their uh, seasonal changes. Um, so these are all things that we've learned from doing the same thing over the course of 50 plus years. Um, and uh, it's one of those things where uh, we have, we wouldn't be able to make these uh, conclusions if we hadn't been doing this for so long. Uh, on the other hand, when we first started, we had no idea that climate change was going to be something. And we had no idea that, well, we had some idea in the late 60s that bird populations were declining because they had been for decades even leading up to that. Um, but uh, we didn't realize that uh, we'd be able to monitor that. Um, so the, uh, the power of our research and our, our long-term monitoring um, has really sort of come out of, of doing the same thing consistently for a very long period of time. Um, so pretty, pretty amazing. Um, we also do a lot of educational work at Manomet too. Since we started um, in the late 60s, uh, we've had interns coming in every year. Um, and we also have school groups come visit as well. Um, now, obviously, as Danielle said earlier on, um, you know, this is, uh, these are definitely unprecedented times. It's been very strange for, for, for me in particular, not to be able to go in and, and have, uh, have fun moments like this where, where uh, kids get to, get to see birds up close and, and in the hand. Um, but uh, yeah, we've been working uh, virtually and obviously you guys have tuned in too. So it's uh, great that we're still able to share what we do. Um, uh, we do a lot of uh, social media posts as well through the banding lab. Um, so uh, we're definitely still sharing what we do. Um, and uh, hopefully once things uh, settle down a bit more, we can uh, start having folks come back in and, and see what we do up close. Um, so let's see. At this point, I'm going to uh, answer a couple questions that have popped up, um, and once that happens, then we will, um, I guess, then we can, um, there we go. Uh, yeah, and then I guess once we do that, uh, we can pop back into the banding lab and, and see if uh, they've got a couple more birds to show. But um, a couple of questions have popped up. Uh, one is about the, uh, the intervals of, of uh, checking nets. Um, it's true that some, some uh, banding locations definitely uh, check their nets very frequently. Um, for us, uh, we usually go, you know, even sometimes around 45 minutes, um, but that's because we have 50 nets. Um, by the time we've checked the first nets, uh, it's almost time to turn around and, and check the other ones anyways. Um, and if we check the nets any sort of sooner than that, um, chances are that we'll be scaring birds away from getting back into the nets. So um, it's something we've sort of ironed out throughout the years, um, but that's sort of what works best for, for our operation. But, uh, you know, obviously, uh, depending on the size of the operation and uh, the, the species that you catch and all of that, um, the timing is something that is, that is always under consideration. Um, Someone is noticing that uh, they're getting more banding recoveries than, uh, than uh, they used to uh, through visual means. Uh, and I will say that uh, with uh, the advances in photography nowadays, particularly on some of the larger bands, um, people can actually piece together a couple of photos of a bird and actually get a visual recovery of a bird, which is pretty amazing, uh, particularly with geese and things. Um, Someone's also wondering if we're seeing changes in morphology of birds, so, so the physical forms of the birds. Um, one of the things that we're sort of unofficially seeing is that we may actually be seeing that our birds are getting slightly larger. Um, th that, of course, is, um, <laughs> that of course is something that's a, a very small amount and not, uh, not, super, uh, not super significant but it's something that uh, we're actually working with other bird observatories to see if they're seeing the same types of uh, changes in their, in their physical shape. Um, someone's also asking about uh, changes in habitat around our net lanes over the 50 years. Um, a lot of banding stations uh, have seen, if they've been going for as long as we have, they've seen some changes in uh, the habitat around their, uh, around their banding, uh, around their nets. 
Um, for us, we've, we certainly have had a little bit of habitat change, uh, but fortunately for us, uh, we're located in some coastal scrubby woods. Um, so it's not necessarily like um, we're getting massive trees moving in and um, overtaking everything. Um, we might be losing some of our clearings throughout the woods as succession happens, um, but uh, generally the coastal scrubby forest has been consistent throughout our, throughout our operation. Um, so we'll get back to some of the other questions in a bit, and if you have more, feel free to type them in. But it looks like the banders have a couple more birds that they, uh, that they might be able to show us. Um, and uh, yeah, we can continue to answer some questions then too. Hi, Megan. Hi, back again. Um, so I've got one of our most commonly captured birds here. Uh, we've actually started to miss them because most of our uh, hatcher birds have gone on their way. Uh, but we've banded about 340 of these guys this season. Um, so this is one of our most favorite birds. It's the gray capper, the unofficial mascot of Manomet. Um, so this is an adult bird, um, and he was also a recapture. I'm saying he, but we don't know. There's a nice classic cat bird sound. So these guys are already processed, um, but I was talking about uh, the molts on cat birds, on birds earlier. So when we age a bird, we look for molt limits in the wing. Um, and this guy has a nice steely gray feathers all over. So we didn't find any molt limits. So we know this is an adult bird. Also, he's got a nice, nice dark adult eye. The hatchier birds will have sort of a, a grayish brown uh, eye. And he's got these lovely rusty undertail coverts that we love. So he's all set in process. And I'm not sure if there's anything else you want to say about cat birds, Evan. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't think so. So uh, cat birds are definitely one of the more uh, vociferous birds in the hand. Um, a lot of people think that, um, you know, that, that birds are super stressed out or um, that it's possible for them to, to get injured while we're banding them. You can see uh, Megan is holding this bird in the bander's grip, and this is keeping the wings at the side of the bird. Um, it's keeping the feet from, from um, you know, potentially hitting anything. Um, and this actually is a very safe way to handle birds. Um, and in reality, birds... Uh, may have slightly elevated stress levels when they're in the hand, but as soon as we release them uh, after a couple minutes, um, they are like little robots. They're just back in their own little world and they go back to exactly what they were doing beforehand. They don't really necessarily recall what happened in the banding lab. Um, so this is good. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I think uh, ready to go. Made a little cat bird sound as he flew away. We've also got um, a thrush. So we've got this nice, nice hermit thrush with this rusty red tail. Um, nice streaking on the front. Also a hatchier bird. I'm not sure if Evan's talked about uh, the majority of the birds that we catch at Manomet in the fall are hatchier birds. They're all hatched this, this fall or this summer. Um, this guy was also a recapture, also a hatchier bird. Nice, yeah. so how, how could you tell that this was a hatchier bird? Does it have any markings? So he's got, all these retained, uh, sorry, retained juvenile uh, coverts right here. So this is one of the molt very, limits. Very pale tips to some of those smaller feathers there. Yeah. These are, yep. Also, I took a look at his skull. <laughs> it was unossified. Nice. So hermit thrushes are a species that uh, will sometimes overwinter in um, the southeastern U.S. Um, but uh, some of them will head even further south down into Central America. So um, both the hermit thrush and the catbird are neotropical migrants. Um, but fantastic. Great to, great to see that up close in the hand. That's usually a bird people don't get to see up close. So 
Thank you. Got one more. <laughs> so this is a <laughs> a bird that we we catch a couple of in the fall but they're always a a joy to see um this is a yellow-breasted chat and they don't uh breed in our area they breed to our south but they do something interesting where in the fall they sort of uh migrate north they wander north and sometimes we'll catch them in the fall it's got a nice big, nice big bill that he's chomping on me with. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, they used to, they used to be in the um, the warbler family, but then they were moved to the blackbird family, and now they're in their own family. So ornithologists aren't really sure where this bird lies in the bird evolution tree. Yeah, this is. Uh, definitely, this is con what would be considered a um, a uh, rare bird for most people out uh, bird watching uh, in Massachusetts, um, but because uh, what Megan said is they don't breed in Massachusetts. I think the closest breeding ones are in uh, maybe Connecticut or New York. Um, but uh, yeah, just like a lot of uh, hatchier birds, uh, they'll migrate to the coast as their um, as their most obvious north south uh, sort of indicator. Um, and a lot of these birds will end up sort of drifting a bit north along the coast. Um, and some chats will actually overwinter um, in Massachusetts, um, or at least try to overwinter in Massachusetts. Um, but uh, yeah, a fantastic bird, one of my favorite birds. Um, <laughs> they are uh, the uh, affectionately known as the buffoon of the briar patch uh, from their uh, singing and everything. So a uh, really a uh, fabulous bird and, and certainly one we're lucky to see uh, up close and in the hand like this. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. Can we watch release? I want to. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Um, all right. Well, thank you, guys. Um, some folks are wondering uh, if you guys have ever encountered um, birds warning each other about the nets. I don't know if they're there. Sorry, oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, I don't think we have encountered birds warning each other about the nets sometimes. Uh, if we have chickadees in the net, they'll be calling to other chickadees. So I, I guess maybe that could be happening, but I'm not really. I feel like that just makes sure. more fly <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. It kind of has the opposite effect. Um, yeah, a classic example of some birds attracting other birds to the nets are things like uh, male orioles. Um, if one oriole flies into a net, um, oftentimes other males will fly down uh, because they're very territorial. Um, so they might uh, fly down to, uh, to oppose the other bird, but uh, they both end up getting captured. Um, I'll say that we do put, someone's wondering about color banding. Um, we don't do color banding necessarily in the in the lab. Um, we're primarily putting silver band or uh, aluminum bands on the birds. Um, yes. Color banding is something that uh, oh nice. Uh, so those are the those are the uh, standard bands that we put on the birds that we catch. Um, but color bands are sometimes used um, like what uh, Sarah has there. Um, and color bands are used to identify individuals in the field. Um, so if we were studying um, a group of individual birds um, and we're curious and wanted to be able to identify individuals of, uh, of, of that group, um, we might put some color bands on them. And we did do some color banding of bluebirds this spring on our property. Um, so we do have some bluebirds uh, that are potentially in the area um, that have some color bands on them. So if we do ever see them again, we'll be able to identify them. But generally we just put our, uh, our aluminum tags on um, and wish them on their way, wish them well on their way. Um, and uh, in general, there's not a very large return on investment. We've banded over a 
quarter of a million birds at Manomet, and we maybe have five or 600 foreign recoveries of a bird being found somewhere else. So it's really only a couple in every thousand birds we ban that are ever encountered again. Uh, so that's really why we're collecting all the other information on the birds um, so that uh, we're uh, getting as much as we can out of our interaction with, with, uh, with that bird in the hand. Um, yeah. Uh, Do you want like a tour of the banning lab? Yeah, we can show you around a little bit. Well, can you can you show them the uh, the computer really quickly? Oh yeah, yeah. You can also say hi to our two interns this year. That's true. Hello. The stars. <laughs> so this is our ancient computer system from 1989, I believe. Oh, we just lost. Sorry. Lost the day. Okay, there we Sorry. go. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So we've had a pretty slow rainy day. Um, so this is actually not too bad for the day that we've had. These are all the birds that we've caught this year, all the different species and who banded them, band numbers, their age and their sex, if we know it. If we go into one, this is where we enter all of our data. So Megan just did this bird. She had 88 wing, five fat, which is really 0.5, which is really only a little trace of fat. No CPVP, um, no active molting going on. So like done with all of its pre-basic molt. Skull of just one. So then we knew it was a hatchier and we knew that by plumage and skull. So this is our code here. So one is plumage. Or what am I saying? Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm talking about the wrong one. <laughs> um, then the net we called that um, and it's weight and the time. If we want to add any extra comments, they go in here. Hmm, this is cool. This is our awesome. Thank you. These are all the our board of all the species that we've caught this year, which is pretty cool. How many have we caught so far? Uh, seventy, I think. Like seventy different species this year, and the date that we first caught each one. All the birds have little four letter codes that we use for species. So we got cedar wax wings uh, on Monday, I think it was. We caught a little flock of cedar wax wings. It's very nice. We were having a slow day. Um, you can show them like the, the back of the desk, which is cool. <laughs> These are all different band sizes that we use <laughs> for all of our birds. So like little tiny birds. Like kinglet sizes, you zero A, and then it goes up from there. They're all slightly different. Whoops. So one of our most common bands that we put out is the 1A. So cardinals and gray cat birds take 1A bands. We've gone, there's a hundred bands on every strand. So we've gone through about three of these strands this season. So about more than 300 bands put out for new bands, which is nice. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got these are little saw wet bands. So saw wets take a, a short band. So they're a little bit different shapes. Um, we've been trying to do some saw wet captures at night because uh, we've heard that it's a good year for hatcher birds. We've caught about five of them so far, which is nice. Really don't catch very many. Yeah, I think that's, that's about all we got. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Unless you guys want to see something else, Evan. No, that's great. Thank you guys. Um, Someone is wondering about uh, if there are any particular books that uh, bird banders use. Oh yeah, good um, question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've got um, the pile guide, which tells us anything about how birds molt when their skull ossifies, um, different subspecies. Uh, we also have the Sibley guide to North American birds. So. We get a confusing fall warbler and we aren't sure what it is. We can look it up in here. Um, warbler page, maybe you can't see the light. Um, the, it's about... Uh, yeah, the, the pile guide is often considered sort of the bird bander's Bible. Uh, <laughs> but I will say that the um, the pile guide, it's, it's called the Identification Guide to North American Birds. It's written by Peter Pyle. Um, and... Uh, it is definitely not something for the faint of heart. 
Um, but it's definitely something that's super useful if you have lots of birds in the hand. Um, and the first 50 or so pages are actually very useful um, knowledge on understanding bird molt. Um, if you're looking for something that's a bit more topical and maybe easier to find, there's um, a book about um, uh, birding basics by, um, by uh, David Allen Sibley. Um, yeah, there it is. Yeah, and don't be fooled by the name of the book if you're interested in learning about bird biology and their molt strategies and things. Um, that's actually a really fantastic book for it. Obviously really well illustrated too. Um, so definitely something to, to uh, get your feet wet as far as understanding molts and, and the different feather groupings on birds. Show up all our books. <laughs> this is Sarah's personal book. Ah, uh, can you, yeah, what's, what's that book like? What it's like to be a bird. Um, it's not so much identification, it's more like life history and just like cool stuff about them. But this is his newest book, which is pretty cool. Nice. Um, it's a slow day for us, so this is our entertainment. <laughs> no, that's that's fine. Um, yeah, so uh, the banding season is really winding down. Um, uh, we band every year in the spring from mid-April to mid-June, so two months in the spring, and then three months in the fall. It goes from mid-August to mid-November, um, so only a couple more weeks left, sad tear. Although by the end of it, um, they'll be getting more leaves in the nets than white-throated sparrows. So, um, yeah. And the, the fall banding season is a bit more protracted um, because uh, the birds take a little bit more time to migrate south. Um, they're, typically, their food resources aren't as, uh, aren't as uh, good at building up uh, fat and whatnot as caterpillars would be in the spring. So it takes a bit longer. Um, yeah, well, uh, thank you guys. Uh, that was really helpful. And uh, yeah. glad, glad it worked out. Uh, yeah, I'm really glad we could get some birds for you guys. We were yeah, worried for, there. Yeah, for the viewers out there, it's been uh, an interesting um, technical and logistical uh, puzzle figuring out how this is all going to work. So it, it seems to have worked. It's, it's good. We're going to learn afterwards that people couldn't see your video or something. Oh, yeah. But, but as, as far as we're concerned, it worked really well. So uh, thank you all. Glad we were able to get some birds before the rain moved in and uh, stay warm. And uh, uh, thanks, Banding Lab, for, for tuning in. Thanks. Oh, I said it was amazing. Thank you. Are we still on? <laughs> yeah, if we could. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, okay. Uh, Evan, so would you like to take a few more questions and then we'll start to wind down here? Uh, sure. Um, let's see. So someone is wondering about the connection between blue jays and acorns, um, which is which is certainly an interesting one and, and somewhat complicated. I'll take a stab at it. Um, uh, blue jays uh, certainly will, will uh, store acorns and, and uh, eat them. They'll store them uh, as food for the winter. Um, and uh, oftentimes uh, they'll make large regional movements in the late summer, early fall um, in relation to where the acorn crops are, are huge. Um, so I have a few oak trees in my yard um, in, Mass in uh, inland Massachusetts, um, and uh, they've been dropping a lot of acorns. Um, so uh, oak trees tend to do something called masting, M-A-S-T, um, where uh, they basically, when they produce acorns, uh, it's usually a large group of those trees regionally that produce acorns. Um, I'm not exactly sure uh, how the trees communicate to each other to, to know to do this, um, but, um, but it tends to happen, and, and it's thought that uh, by masting, um, the trees actually saturate the, um, the seed predator population. So things like uh, squirrels and, and uh, blue jays will get so many acorns that they can't keep track of all of them, and in the process of storing them and burying them in places, they'll invariably forget about one or two of them. And so those trees will then have some of their seeds get dispersed. Um, so pretty interesting relationship for sure. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, so I, I think that's all I've got. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, you guys know how to get in touch with us if you do have any other questions. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you all for joining us on this. Uh, what is it? I, I've lost track of the day of the week. I guess it's a Thursday morning. Yes. <laughs> it is. Um, thank you very much, Evan, for coming, for uh, explaining everything today and for uh, coordinating with Megan and Sarah. We really enjoyed seeing the banding lab. Um, thank you to everybody else for being part of this, uh, the audience today and this special presentation. I know that many of you are longtime supporters of Manomet, and I just wanted to say thank you. We are very grateful for your generosity and commitment to our work, and I hope very much that we'll see you on a future webinar or in person at our banding lab again someday soon. Thank you so much, and have a great day, and we'll talk to you very soon. Bye.